In medieval times, it was the necessarium. Today, it's the washroom. But no matter what we might call it, we know what we mean. The history of the toilet is fascinating. The uh, problem seems to have occupied many great minds through the years. Now, I'm only allowed to quote brief passages from this book in criticism. Nice book. In days of old, the various appliances that passed for toilets discharged directly into a stream or moat. That should explain why the attacking armies didn't simply swim the moat. And anyone who longs for the good old days should check out Leonardo da Vinci's proposal for 10 new towns. He suggested the use of spiral staircases to prevent the sanitary misuse of the stair landings. It's hard to credit the invention of the flush toilet to any one person. In a way, it's still being invented. In British toilet lore, the name George Jennings is prominent. He seems to have invented the pay toilet, which he called a halting station. And one of his conveniences which nature demands won a prize in 1884 for flushing in one flush 10 apples averaging an inch and a quarter in diameter, a flat sponge about four and a half inches in diameter, plumber's smudge coated over the bowl, and four pieces of paper adhering closely to the soiled surface. By 1890, there were three types of toilet in use, the valve closet, the washout closet, and the wash down closet. This picture of a valve closet called the Optimus might explain why a few have survived. Most of our 20th century closets are the wash-down type. The author of Clean and Decent, Lawrence Wright, credits a Mr. D.T. Bostel with its invention, about 1889. There are currently a lot of variations on the basic washout concept. Whatever the style, though, they all rely on a sudden inrush of water. The contents of a toilet tank are probably well known. Who among us hasn't gotten out of bed at 3 a.m. to adjust that float? This is a pretty common tank. When you push the flush handle, the flush valve actuator raises and starts water rushing out of a hole in the bottom of the tank. Once the flush valve is up, it stays up due to its design. As the water level drops, the float rides down with it, opening the water inlet. Replacement water comes into the tank through a small diameter pipe. That small pipe can't compete with the large hole at the bottom, so the tank continues to empty. When the water level falls almost to the bottom, the flush valve can fall back into place from its own weight, and the tank refills for the next flush. This is half of my favorite toilet. It's a good flusher, and it's low cost. Two things I appreciate in a toilet. Its model name is the Plebe, but don't let its lowly name fool you. It's actually a reverse trap, vortex action, jet assist toilet. See, the sewer's a smelly place, so all of the sinks and toilets in our house have traps. On a sink, the trap's found underneath. With a toilet, the trap's an integral part. The trap traps water. This is the connection to the sewer down here, and this is the basic route from the bowl to the sewer. While waiting for a flush, water gets trapped here. This keeps water in the bowl and blocks dangerous and disgusting gases from wafting up from the sewer. When you activate the tank, water rushes in through this hole and starts to flow around the rim. Under the rim are some angled holes. The water enters the bowl through these holes with a swirling motion. Once the water level is high enough to flow over this dam, a siphon action starts. That siphon action is aided by this restriction that speeds up the flow. The whole thing causes suction to empty the bowl. Now, at the same time, Water is still flowing around the rim over to the front, where it falls down this channel and shoots past the bottom of the bowl, adding energy to the flush. This channel and hole are the jet assist. When the bowl clears, air rushing in here breaks the siphon action, and the bowl refills from the last bit of water from the flush. Different styles of bowls have different flush actions. This one's a vortex action luxury product. The bowl's cleared by the powerful swirling action from the holes under the rim. It's the quietest style.
This one's a siphon jet. It's a little different. Water first enters the jet passage, starting the siphonic action that empties the bowl. After the jet gets things going, water backs up in the passage and flows out into the rim, where the swirling action scours the bowl. There are pros and cons to each design. Some use more water, and some are quieter than others. But no matter what the style, this is where the crossword puzzle pencil gets stuck. Now, it'll start its own collection of stuff and clog the whole works. You should keep the pencil on the bathtub, not on top of the toilet tank. All in all, it's a pretty marvelous device, uh, particularly when you consider the alternatives. Have you ever thought about how many toilets you've seen in your lifetime? I've seen thousands, mostly last week. The first thing you notice in a toilet plant is a lot of toilets. Officially, this is a vitreous china operation. China is a mixture of clays and other earthy ingredients that's turned solid by firing in a very hot kiln. Toilets start their life on the roof of this plant and in underground wells. Turning clay into toilets is a tricky operation. An automated bunch of controls carefully measures and mixes huge batches of the clay. The ingredients are formed into a liquid called slip. The exact mixture and the water content of the slip are critical. It has to be liquid enough to be poured into molds, yet ready to go solid. It's called the edge of stability. This lab monitors the characteristics of the slip. This machine measures the modulus of rupture, how hard it is to break when dry. There are a whole bunch of tests performed here, from viscosity to moisture content in the finished product. From the mixer and into the sieve, it's under the floor, where the slip is ready to meet the molds. The liquid clay slip is cast into shape in plaster molds. So if you want to start your own toilet plant, all you need is some slip, some molds, and a few magicians. There are two facts of life in the vitreous china biz, shrink and slump. By the time the original piece leaves the kiln, it will have shrunk about 12%. And as well as shrinking in all directions, the soft clay slumps under its own weight. The very first step in creating a toilet is to make a wooden version. This one is identical in shape to the one that will finally emerge from the kiln. The next step is to make one that looks like the one that will enter the kiln before shrink and slump do their thing. An interesting sculpture job that relies on experience, trial and error. Here's the difference in size between a finished tank lid and the unshrunk version. After the final plaster model is perfect, it's recreated in several pieces then encased in plastic. The plastic mold is the mold for the mold for the mold.
result of all this is a plaster inside out piece that will cast the actual pieces. Each time a mold is used to cast a clay piece, it absorbs a lot of water and then it's dried out. Each plaster mold will make somewhere between 60 and 100 pieces before it has to be retired. These are tank molds. The slip is poured into the molds through plastic funnels. The plastic funnels not only allow the mold to be filled, but act as a supply of extra slip. As the mold sucks water from the clay, the leftover slip in the funnel flows into the mold to keep it full. The casting process takes just over an hour. You'll notice that the clothing in the plant is a little skimpy. The plaster molds need a warm, dry environment. Here's a luxury toilet coming out of its molds. The bigger, fancier models are cast totally by hand. There's a lot of sculpture at every step. This jig ensures that the rim holes are punched at the exact angles for a good swirl. And yes, they do go in the other direction in Australia. The stuff in the cake decorator is a mixture of slip designed to sort of glue the pieces together. It's called butter slip. At this stage, the clay has the look and feel of milk chocolate, and it's just as fragile. This casting line is a little more automated. These are the high volume sellers, the plebes. Another fact of life in the vitreous china business, broken pieces are recycled. Tough and attractive. That about sums up the reasons that all china is glazed. In the arts and crafts room at summer camp, you probably fired a clay pot in a kiln and let it cool and then glazed it and refired it again. Toilets and sinks are fired all at once with their glaze already applied. This is a little trickier than summer camp. The glaze and clay have to like each other. More tests. This one ensures that the glaze and clay have similar expansion characteristics in the kiln. These rings show the amount of tension placed on the clay by the glaze, by the amount they spring apart when they're cut. The color's carefully controlled too, so that a replacement sink will match a 20-year-old toilet and vice versa. There's an interesting thing about the glaze color at the plant. It all looks white. The glaze is pulverized in large drums filled with these ceramic balls until it's a very fine powder. 
no matter what color a glassy substance really is, if you crush it small enough, it looks white. One of the things that impresses you on the tour of the factory is the amount of hand finishing that goes on at every step of the process. These units are being prepared for glazing. Luxury products are totally hand finished, while assembly line products are finished on another assembly line. The person who invented this machine probably got their inspiration in a car wash. Yeah, I could use one of these machines at home. Ah, uh, life is one big assembly line for the pleads. The robot spraying arms know whether they're glazing a pair of tanks or a bowl by coated holders underneath. Once again, the lower volume luxury products are done by hand. The powdered glazes are mixed with water for spraying. Any overspray is collected and recycled. Hurry up and dry, will you? It's time to screen the company logo on you. Now it's time to start the train ride to the kiln. The trip can be a little jerky, so here and there are pieces of styrofoam to absorb shock. Also, the clay pieces become soft during firing and require supports. The sinks will slump onto platforms so that they'll be perfectly flat for mounting. Tanks are fired with their lids on so that the two can shrink and slump together. This toilet will slump all the way down to that brick. There are five of these continuous kilns in this plant. At the center, the pieces of china reach 1,200 degrees Celsius. That's a real hot Fahrenheit. Look carefully, the toilets are moving. The trip through the kiln will take many hours. Oops again. Some of the fired products have boo-boos. One of the great things about China is that it can be fixed and refired. The glaze in this department has a brightly colored vegetable dye added to it to identify which glaze is which. Cast, sanded, glazed, and fired. The products are almost ready for shipping. The assembly line products get a visual check and a flush testing. This blue dye will show up minute cracks in the glaze. The large one-piece units are flush tested differently. The test has been modernized, no apples, just six sponges along with some pieces of balled up paper and a cup of sawdust.
way to go. From the flush, it's on to shipping. And as they say in the toilet biz, their fate awaits. Once you've been to the plant, you can reminisce just by looking at the tank lid. The inside isn't smoothed and glazed. This is just the bare clay. It's got tiny little marks left by each person who handled it. The stuff around the outside of the lid is hydrate. It kept the lid from sticking to the tank in the kiln. And if the piece has been fixed and refired, it'll have various handwriting on it and grease pencil. There are a couple of little holes in the tank lid, too. They had extra slip poured out of them after the piece was cast. You see, the inside of the thick parts is hollow. Personally, I'll never look at a toilet the same way again. Now, audience studies tell us that some of our viewers have run to have a look at their toilets during the show. And perhaps you yourself are dying to go have a look at yours. I won't keep you, but I'd like to close with a quote from the bottom of an 18th century chamber pot. Use me well and keep me clean, and I'll not tell what I have seen. Thank you.